In church, I actually am cheating. I usually don't read off of anything, but after our message last week, if you were here to join us, if you weren't, you can hop online and check it out. We learned of the Holy Spirit, and this morning as we start in worship, we are going to begin off inviting the Holy Spirit into this place. If you're not receiving our emails, let us know, fill out a card in the back, but the one that went out this week reminds us the Holy Spirit regenerates us, convicts us, empowers us with gifts, testifies in our hearts that we are God's children. The Holy Spirit leads us, makes us fruitful, grants and nurtures in us resurrection life, enables us to kill sin, intercedes for us when we don't know what to pray, guides us into truth, and transforms us into the image of Christ. That is an awesome list of what the Holy Spirit can do in and through you. So would you please rise up on your feet this morning? We're going to start off by inviting the Spirit into this place and to fill this atmosphere with the love and the same way is only found through God and the Lord Jesus Christ.
right, these people come early on Sunday morning and they practice during the week and they pour their hearts out and we're all incredibly gifted musically, but you all love Jesus and you're here to lead us in worship and it's just good. It's my favorite hour of the whole week and I'm so grateful for them. So thanks. Way to make me emotional. Thanks. Thanks, Grant. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you're here today in person and the Lord prompts you to give a monetary gift, there's a little box on the table in the back you can donate in. Uh, if you're online, you can mail it to PO Box 101 and Climber or get on the whatisyourcompass.org and you can give digitally. If you're here in person, there are some notes in the back that have holes in them. Please take them home with you so you can study them. Uh, we have binders you can put them in. And on the back of the sermon notes, there's all kinds of good information about the ministry, so grab that, take it home, study it. Brian opened the service with the role of the Holy Spirit. So if you were gone last week, if you're online and you missed, you get on the whatisyourcompass.org, you click on the sermon notes, and they're there. So last Sunday for the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit? He regenerates us. That's in John 3. If you didn't study that this week, look it up this week. The Holy Spirit convicts us. That's in John 16. Look that up this week. He empowers us with gifts, 1 Corinthians 12. And Pam talked all about that at the women's retreat. If you're a woman or a man and you missed the retreat, ask one of us who was there. We'll tell you about it. It was really, really good. The Holy Spirit testifies in our hearts that we are God's children, Galatians 4, 6. We belong to him. He's our father. It's good stuff. There are a whole bunch more of these, so make sure you study these and take them home. If we could all really understand the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, I'm telling you, it would change everything. A uh, huge thank you to everybody that came last night to the McCrae's, to the meal. I'm always amazed at how God provides. So David and Sadie said they would provide the sandwiches and the chips and the drinks. And so I thought, you know, what if we come and there's 400 brownies? And that's all there is. Like most of us would be like, thank you, Jesus, the Lord provided. <laughs> or what if we come and there's 400 baked beans and nothing else? Like I'm always like a little nervous as a mom, like, is there going to be a vegetable there? Is there going to be a fruit? Like, what if it, you know? And we got there, and there was this fantastic spread. There was broccoli salad, and watermelon, and grapes, and homemade cheesecake. Thank you, Clara. I'm telling you, you missed it. You weren't there. There was all this amazing food. And I thought, you see how God works? We simply show up and are faithful to come when he invites us. And he spreads out a feast better than we can imagine. So if you missed last night, next time we have one, please come. Those of you that came and brought food, thank you. I'm still full today. It was wonderful. And women last week was one of those powerful Sundays. So thank you, Miss Pam. Thank you, women who came. We were challenged to move and to look for the sign in our life and to use our gifts. So ask the women, because they're supposed to be doing some things. They've got homework to live out. Thank you to the men for the Thursday night group and the Saturday morning group. I don't know if I can talk about this. So Mike got home yesterday. And he said, I've never driven home from a Bible study and cried the whole way. Now, Mike is not the ball baby that I am. And he shared with our family the tears and the way God really moved him yesterday morning. And he's going to share some of that next Sunday in his sermon. As a teaser, you might want to come back next Sunday and hear what he has to say. It's pretty powerful. There's all kinds of great stuff going on, so we want to thank God for it. As Brian said, if you're not getting our weekly emails, let us know. We'll add you in. We send out a devotion on Wednesday and the sermon notes on Saturday. It's all a lot of good stuff. So I want to invite the kids to come forward, and Ms. Pam has a word for the kids this morning. Oh, this 
to have gone this way. <laughs> Open your eyes. <laughs> it's on. You see it? Eva, you're right by it. Yep. Yeah, give yeah, it. Bring it forward. We need our bird. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. The first time you went by, it wasn't sitting there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So we have the bird with the bird house. Okay. All right. I know. It doesn't fit real well. Okay. So what's this? Usually it's full of water. What goes in it? Yeah, you got it. Fishbowl. So what goes in the fishbowl? Okay, there are three fish out there. It's a lot of fish. And this is a 
song that we started this whole service with eight years ago, coming out of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that we want to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and not our own understanding, which is really hard to do sometimes. Sometimes we pray for things and God doesn't answer our prayers the way we want him to. Sometimes we ask God to move mountains in our lives and he doesn't move the mountains we ask him to. And we still have to trust him. That's part of, as Mike talked about last week, how a child just trusts their parent. Sometimes we don't understand what our parents tell us to do, and we don't understand why they say things to us, but we have to trust that they know best. So please stand as we sing the song with our trust in the Lord.
where we struggle to trust in your plan, where we struggle to see the goodness in the middle of a painful situation, where we struggle to see the light in the middle of darkness, where we've asked and we've begged and we've prayed for a prayer to be answered and a mountain to be moved, and it simply hasn't happened. So God, in those moments when we struggle, remind us that we really can put our trust in you, that your plan is good, that you have your eye on us, that you are always working, even the tough times out for your good, and you have an incredible love for us, your children. God, we thank you for every good gift you give us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would teach us and guide us and convict us and comfort us and move in us and through us. Thank you for your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the picture on the screen is from the house we used to live in a couple years ago. We were looking out across Gravel Hill Road, and this is our neighbor's barn. And if you can tell on the bottom, it was a foggy morning. So when Grace was really little, she would run up to the window and look out the window and say, Dad, it's foggy fog. It's foggy fog. I don't know why we called it foggy fog. It wasn't just plain old fog. It was foggy fog which meant it was kind of hard to see and it wasn't clear. Have you ever had a day where it's a foggy fog day? <laughs> I've had a lot of those foggy fog days lately where I just can't quite spiritually see what God is doing. Sometimes the foggy fog days are physical days, like you have a headache or you have the flu or your doctor calls and the cancer is back. Or you get bad news that there was an accident and someone you love is gone. Or the stock market went, and you're like, how am I going to retire now? Sometimes there are physical foggy fog days in our lives. But sometimes it's a spiritual foggy fog. And we just kind of have that heavy weight on our chest. We just feel like something's wrong and you don't know what it is. And you're just struggling and you can't quite pray. Here's the good news on the foggy fog days. The fog isn't permanent. It doesn't last forever. Every morning the sun rises. So even though it was a foggy fog morning, the sun was breaking through and the fog eventually dissipated. So last Sunday we talked about Pentecost and Mike walked us through all the great scriptures Brian and I have talked about. We talked about who the Holy Spirit is. And if you weren't here, and if you were here, I challenge you to go back and watch the sermon and study the sermon notes again. I've looked through them a few times, and every time I do, I get convicted in a different way. Pentecost is something that happened thousands of years ago. And as we've talked for a few weeks about biblical remembrance, we remember Pentecost so we can bring it back today. So we can have Pentecost in our lives every day. So we can experience the Holy Spirit. So the fog can kind of disappear and the sun can break through. Because we need the sun. We need the sun, the S-O-N, and we need the sun, S-U-N. There's something powerful, isn't there, about a sunrise or a sunset and how beautiful it is and how it just captivates you and you go, oh, wow, this is amazing. So my prayer today is that you will start to feel a little more of the Holy Spirit in your life so that the fog will dissipate and the sun will shine a little bit brighter. The sermon today is about Trinity truths that transform us. That is a tongue twister. Try to say that ten times fast. Addison's trying. Trinity truths transform us. Trinity truths transform us. The Trinity is the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the church calendar, like you can keep a calendar, you keep track of birthdays and anniversaries and the first day of school and the last day of school. In the church calendar, we celebrate Christmas, which is a big one. We celebrate Easter, which is a big one. Last Sunday was Pentecost, which is a big one. Today in the church calendar is Trinity Sunday. And most of you might be thinking, and what does that mean? Trinity Sunday follows Pentecost Sunday because on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And Trinity Sunday is when we celebrate the fullness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now this is just my opinion of what I have observed in my own life and in the church in general after 26 years of ministry, some of us really live into the Father. Like, God is our Father, and we love Him, and we trust Him. Some of us love the Son, and we're grateful for Jesus, and He saved us. And some of us are more Spirit-filled than others, and we're, woo, no Holy Spirit. But what if we live into the truth that all 
three of them offer to us, we would be transformed as a church and as individuals and our families. So this is what I'm praying today, is that the truths about the Trinity that we're going to learn about will transform us the way that the sun breaks through the fog and helps us to see clearly. Not just physically, but I want us to see spiritually. So go ahead, Joe. If you have your sermon notes, we're going to be looking at John 14. If you want to get a pew Bible out or if you're at home and want to open up your Bible, this is Jesus speaking to his friends. And these are really important words to hear. So we're going to start from John 14. This is Jesus explaining how he's the way to the Father. So remember, we're talking about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So God is three in one. It's kind of confusing, but I'm hoping that as we walk through the scripture, this will help explain it. So verse 1 in John 14, Jesus says, and maybe you need to hear this today, do not let your hearts be troubled. Amen. Sarah, preach it. Anybody else need to hear that today? Do not let your heart be troubled, whatever you're going through. Jesus says, believe in God, the Father, believe also in me. Now, how do we not let our hearts be troubled when we watch the news, when we hear what's going on, when we get frustrated with the world and life and sin? How do we not get troubled? Here, in my Father's house, Jesus says, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'd go to prepare a place for you? Now stop for a minute. When you're going to go on a vacation, and maybe you're going to go visit a family member who is far away you haven't seen them for a while. And they start to tell you about the countdown in five days, four days, three days. I'm getting it ready. I'm preparing it. I'm stocking the fridge. I'm washing the towels. I'm getting the bed ready. Everything's going to be prepared for you. The anticipation builds. Jesus is telling us, you don't have to be troubled or afraid of what's happening in the world because I'm preparing something for you. So what is he preparing? Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. So now, remember what we have just been going through as a church. We had Easter where Jesus died and he rose. And we had Pentecost where he ascended and then he sent the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is saying, I don't think you have to be troubled. Because I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come get you and bring you to me. And where I am... You're going to be. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be where Jesus is. Because where Jesus is, there's freedom, and there's grace, and there's goodness, and there's not sin, and everything is wonderful. So Jesus says, I'm preparing this place for you. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Hey, I want to know where Jesus is going, and I want to know the place. So Thomas, one of his disciples, said, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And how many times have we asked that question? God, just show me the way. Just tell me what to do. Just open the road sign to me, Pam, and show me exactly which green light to go through. If you just show me the way, Lord, I will go. So Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. So if you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. So what is the way to this place that Jesus prepares? The way is Jesus. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. We simply go to him, and he gets us to the Father. So listen. Verse 8, Philip says to him, Well, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Now, how many times have you said to the Lord in a prayer, If you just show me this, God, if you just show me who you are, if you just show me, I will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me, does his works. Believe me that I am the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe because of the works themselves. Very truly, verse 12, I say to you, the one who believes in me, listen to this, believe it or not, will also do the works that I do. And in fact, 
will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. So hold on a second. What were the things that Jesus did? Jesus healed those who were lame. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. Jesus raised the dead Lazarus and brought him to life. Jesus forgave people of their sins. Jesus took five loaves and two fish and multiplied them into more food than they could count in a basket. Jesus did some pretty darn amazing things. And then he says to us, Guess what? You're going to do even greater things. What in the world does that mean? How is that even possible? Because we are sinful. We're not the Son of God. We're not the Father Almighty. But keep listening. In verse 13, Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may be glorified, and that I may be glorified in the Son. If my, in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Now, stop for a second here, because there's a lot of misconceptions about this verse. This does not mean, Lord Jesus, I saw that beautiful red Corvette standing out there, and I really want you to just turn the keys over to me when I open my eyes. Amen. You can't pray like that, and the Corvette will just appear magically. But if we're praying, and our hearts are aligned with Jesus, we're praying, Lord, your will be done, not mine. Amen. And if we're praying, Lord, what you want to happen, you think he doesn't want to answer that prayer? So when we pray in the name of Jesus, we're not praying for our own selfish gain. We're praying for what he wants. And when we pray that way, yeah, he answers those prayers. So if you're like, Lord, I really want to know more about you. I really want to get closer to you. I want to know who you are, and I'm praying this in your name. You think he's not going to just want to reveal himself to you? Last Sunday, Mike shared the story about our kids and they would come in for lunch. And he talked about how Lucas would climb up the stairs and slam the door. And you could hear his feet running. And Mike would brace himself because Lucas would jump on him and about to tackle him. And he was so excited to see him every time. Do you think if Lucas would have said, Dad, can we play show that big sandwich now? When Lucas asked for things, Mike's going to say, no, not today. Now, you're not going to eat today, kid, sorry. You're just going to sit there. I mean, when your kid asks you for food, you give it to them willingly and joyfully and happily. You can't wait to share that moment with them. When we come to Jesus and we ask in his name, wanting what he wants, that's when he says, I'm going to do that. I'm going to work for you. So you've got to understand that verse very carefully. And that's part of the Trinity truths that I want to talk about today. We have access to God the Father who, as Pam talked about, created the whole world in Genesis. We have access to God because of Jesus, because of the Son. And God and Jesus are one and the same, and yet are different. And that makes no sense, and you have to have that come at you by faith. So Jesus is saying, you get to be to God if you come to me, because I'm the same as my Father. We're one. So how is that possible? Go ahead, Joe. So we continue in John 14 on verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So yesterday, when Mike came home from his Bible study, we were talking with the kids and reminiscing on some of our parenting um, successes and mistakes over the last 21 years. We are not perfect parents. We have made plenty of mistakes. If you want to ask our kids, they could talk for hours. I'm sure and tell you about them. But we talked about the Bible study Mike and I did when they were little called Growing Kids God's Way. And in the Bible study... He talked about how you want to teach your kids to obey. And when they start out young, you teach them to obey because they have to. Because we're the parents and we know how to keep them safe. And the kids are young, they don't understand the rules. For example, last night at McCray's, we're eating. And Jody English was like a hawk on Kaylee. Because Kaylee likes to run around, she's fast, and the road was right there. Now, why do you want your kid to obey you and not run into the road? Because you want to keep them alive. Right? The parent knows that. The kid doesn't understand that. So Mike used to try to teach Grace to be obedient. And he would take her out in the backyard. And I really should probably have you come up and tell the story. But he would take her out in the backyard and pull her throat a stick and say, okay, Grace, look me in the eye and say, I'm going to go pick up that stick. Yes, Dad. And then go pick up the stick. Because he wanted to start to get her to obey. Kind of like training a, a little puppy dog. Okay. And now the reason for this is because there was a time when Grace was Katie's age and she didn't run in the middle of the road. 
while we were talking to people after church, and right after we snagged her, somehow went whipping by, and it was that close. So we realized, like, this is important for the sake of her safety. And Mike tells the story that he'd start to throw the twin, and she'd just run after him. And he'd say, no, 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 Grace, say yes, Dad. The twin shouldn't be running and getting this yes, Dad, but go do it. Why do we make our kids obey us? Because we want them to be safe. But as they grow older, we don't want them to obey us because they have to. We want them to obey because they want to. There's a point in the parent-child relationship where it changes, and the kid doesn't just get home by 11 o'clock curfew because they have to, but they get home by 11 o'clock curfew because they want to, Sarah, because they want to obey their parents. Jesus is saying, if you love me, you obey my commands. You don't just obey my commands because you have to, because, oh, you can't sin, you can't commit adultery, you can't steal, you can't commit murder, you can't do the Ten Commandments. We obey him because we love him. Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. So Jesus is letting them know, I'm going to die, I'm going to leave, but you won't be orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Verse 20, on that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it's from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said. So it's Trinity Sunday. So God the Father is the one who sent his son Jesus. Jesus is the one who died and reconciled us to the Father. And then Jesus said, now I'm sending the Spirit to be with you every day, to help you, to guide you, to convict you. So go ahead, Joe. So then Jesus wraps up John 14 in verse 27. Peace I leave with you. Last night at the bonfire, somebody asked me, so who's preaching tomorrow? And I said, I am. And like, what are you preaching on? And I said, well, the Holy Spirit and Trinity and John 14 and peace and the need for peace. And this mom said to me, oh, I need peace. I said, amen. Don't we all need peace, ironically? <laughs> We all need a little bit of the peace Jesus offers. So listen to what he says in verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. That was what we started in John 14, remember? Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I'm coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now that I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. Maybe you need to hear that today. Satan likes to attack and divide. And in John 10.10, 10, it says that he comes to steal and kill and destroy but if we have Jesus in us, and we have the Holy Spirit in us, Jesus said, that devil has no power over me. Do you understand that? So when Satan attacks us, and we get so frustrated with the devil, we have to remind ourselves of what Jesus said. Satan has no power over Jesus, and we have Jesus in us. Jesus says, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us be on our way. So Mike and I have talked about our trips to Israel with Ray Vanderlaan. Ray Vanderlaan has a ministry called That the World May Know. Where did he get the title for his ministry? And he takes people 
all of Israel. He has these amazing teachers. He travels and he transforms people with his talks and his Bible teaching. He gets his ministry out of this verse in John 14. So the world may know. So why do we have Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit? And why do we experience Pentecost? And why do we pray for more of God in our lives? So that we can experience it, but also so that the world will know who he is. All right, go ahead, Joe. So Mike and I have been preaching from and talking about this book by Dave Orland called Gentle and Lowly. This is what he says when he talks about the Trinity. What should come into our mind when we think about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? The triune God is three in one, a fountain of endless mercy extending, overflowing, providing for us everything we need. This is who he is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Wayne Grudem says this, in one sense, the doctrine of the Trinity is a mystery that we will never be able to understand fully. So if you're sitting there today thinking, this whole Trinity thing, I can't wrap my mind around it. You're not meant to wrap your mind around it. You're not going to understand it fully. However, we can understand something of its truth by summarizing the teaching of Scripture in three statements. God is three persons. Each person is fully God. And there is one God. There you have it. That's the Trinity in a nutshell. Go ahead, Joe. That quote is also in your sermon notes if you want to take out from the study that more. So here are the three parts, and this is what I want to wrap up with. Trinity truths that will transform you. If you know who God is, and who Jesus is, and who the Spirit is, and you start to tap into praying all three of them, it will transform you. So God is a good, good Father. He's faithful. You can trust Him. If you trust your Father's provision daily, it will change everything. So Mike talked last week about how our kids would run in the house, so excited for Dad to greet them and to have lunch with them and share a meal with them. Did you ever trust one time that there would not be food to eat? Did you ever think, well, what if Dad isn't there? What if he doesn't feed me? What if he doesn't take care of me? Did, did you ever doubt that? Any of the three of you? Of course not, because you trust your Father. You trust he'll take care of you. In the same way a young child trusts their parents, we need to trust God. He's a good dad. He will take care of us. So this is the prayer I wanted to pray this week so that you can start to tap into this Trinity truth that will transform you. So it's in your sermon notes. God, you are faithful and put my trust in you. So when you have one of those really bad days this week, or you, you get kind of fearful, or you start to struggle, or you get tired, I want you to pull this out. God, you are faithful. I'm going to put my trust in you. It's like the song we sang. Even if the mom doesn't move, even if the prayer is answered, what if you would trust God this week? Because he's your dad, and he wants to take care of you. All right, second truth comes from Jesus, who is a Savior who bore all of our sins so that we can be reconciled to the Father. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So John 10.10, 10, which talked about Satan attacking us, also says that Jesus came to give us abundance. How many of you want abundance? Like, you just want to live into it fully. So this is a prayer that Pastor Kevin Corver taught me when I was going to the Third Reformed Church in Pella, Iowa during my college days. He said, I would start every day reminding myself who God is and who I am. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So we start with God the Father. He's good. We can trust him. And then we go to Jesus, who made the way for us to be reconciled to the Father. And we say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And you know what? He gives us mercy every time. And then finally, the third one is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper, our paraclete, our comforter, our guide, all the things that Mike talked about last week, all those scriptures. And he connects us to the Father and the Son. I don't know about you, but I need God the Father that I can trust. I need Jesus to save me from my sin. And I need the Holy Spirit every minute of every single day. So I had a friend in high school. And she married a guy named Mike Megason. And Mike Megason emailed me years ago, and I've never forgotten. And he said, Aaron, well, you don't know what to pray. Romans 8 says the Spirit will intercede with groans and words you can't understand. And you simply need to cry out, Holy Spirit, help. He's like, when you walk into a room and you start to get panicked, Holy Spirit, help. When you have this feeling like, I don't know what to say or pray, Holy Spirit, help. And the Holy Spirit will help because the Holy Spirit does that. All right, Joe, so we got one more to wrap this up. 
Trinity Truths for You to Trust. This is what's in the little box on the sermon notes for you to take home. God is a good, good father who is faithful. You can trust him, no matter what. God sent his only son, Jesus, to prepare the way for us so that we would believe in the Father. He saves us from our sin. And the Holy Spirit lives in us and empowers us to have peace and to guide us. I want peace. I don't want my heart to be troubled. I don't want to be afraid. And I want to look forward to the hope of the place he's preparing for me. You do? Isn't that important? Uh, the song that we're going to close with today is called, Lord, I Need You. Oh, I Need You. I don't know about you, but I need God the Father. I need the Holy Spirit. I need Jesus the Son, all to help me. Now, how can you experience this this week? So, as we wrap this up today, last Sunday, Mike had that donut on stage from Clara, and he read through the ingredients, and he talked about how it doesn't be any good to have the donut ingredients if you're not going to be eat it and experience it and taste it. So, I can stand here and preach for two more hours, and I can read all of John 14 to you again, but it's just a recipe for you. Now the ball is in your court. Now you need to take these sermon notes home with you and open up your Bible and reread John 14 this week and start to pray, God, you're good, you're faithful, I can trust you. Jesus, I need you to forgive me of my sin. Holy Spirit, help. And start to let these truths transform you throughout the week. So last night, as we were at the praise, there was a family that had three little kids there. I believe they were like five, three, and two. And the five-year-old, the oldest sister, would be running around and let a shadow. The little three-year-old brother would follow behind, wouldn't miss a beat. And then all of a sudden, the younger sister would follow behind, and the three of them would just go off together. And there was a moment where these three kids out of nowhere just came together and just hugged each other. And I said to their dad, they get along so well. And he was like, yeah, not always. But it was this beautiful moment, and I thought, this is the Trinity. This is God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're one. They love each other. They're together. But they're all different. And we need all of them in our lives. And I want you to experience fully how God the Father loves you. How the Holy Spirit can empower you. And how Jesus connects us to all of them. So I don't know about you. I need them. And so do you. So please pray with me as we wrap up. God, thank you for Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for Jesus, the Son, who died and rose and is coming again and prepares a place for us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that gives us peace that this world cannot touch. God, we need you. And so as we go out into this week, I pray that these truths about the Trinity would transform our families and our lives. God, help us to take this recipe home and talk about it and pray about it. God, you are good and we can trust you. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. And Holy Spirit, help. Help us to rely on you because we need you. Oh, how we need you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. is where